Okay. Dr. Galis, please come forward. Thanks, George. You, you got it on. You All right. On. Okay, good for you. Well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, really a privilege to be here, an honor to meet with you, old friends, Gene and George. I've known them for many years. I'm honored to be back for a third time. So obviously, I did something right in the past two times I've spoken. So uh, really a, a lot of fun to be back and share some ideas. Um, am I lost? Okay. It's just a step. <laughs> And then and you can just close that up here. Yeah. Anyway, there we go. Well, again, thanks so much for inviting me to. Uh, let me just get this expanded. Where are we here? Good. So I thought I'd give a sort of a more general overview to some new information in the way I look at prostate cancer in the early phase. We've spoken before here about advanced prostate cancer, but I wanted to confine my remarks to early stage prostate cancer and look at some new concepts in the screening, which George is so appropriately, it takes an engineer with that analytical mind to get onto the information, analyze it, dissect it, comment on it, and make it actionable, which I commend you doing. Um, and then talk a little bit about active surveillance approaches for prostate cancer. So the outline to give you a little bit of a historical perspective on prostate cancer, which I'm sure you're all well versed in, uh, talk a little bit about what George just commented on this week. We heard some new information from the United States Preventative Services Task Force, which I'll remind you does not have a single urologist on the panel. And they made these comments, and so uh, I'll share a little more details. Uh, the variability of the disease, what we call heterogeneity of the biology of the disease, treatment-related outcomes, focus on active surveillance. We're going to introduce genomics. I'm sure many of you have heard about it, and we're privileged to have uh, one of genomic health's um, individuals, Jeremiah Johnson. We welcome. We appreciate you being here. Jeremiah can... Um, present you afterwards with information. He's brought some educational materials that he'll share with you later on. And then I heard you just had a talk recently on multi-parametric MRI. I'm not going to go in too much, but I think with active surveillance, there's a place for it. Uh, and I'll just comment briefly and then discussion and then you'll educate me and uh, we'll have a collaborative discussion. So some background, we all know that prostate cancer is the most common solid um, mal malignancy affecting American men, second leading cause of cancer death. And the lifetime risk has almost doubled the lifetime risk of dying from prostate cancer or being diagnosed from prostate cancer rather, has doubled from 9% to 17% since the introduction of PSA, which was about 1989-1990, the introduction of the PSA test, which you heard. And remember, let me, I'll, I'll mention at the point when I talk about PSA and screening, don't forget the DRE, the Digital Rectal Exam. Um, the lifetime risk, fortunately, of dying from prostate cancer is only 3%. And I think a lot has to do with the early detection of prostate cancer using the PSA test. So the dilemma, the overdiagnosis and overtreatment, and we heard a real what we call a real-world experience here this morning of a gentleman, I think you said 27 years on active surveillance. So uh, that gentleman could have been treated 27 years ago and might have had side effects from treatment, which is where the dilemma of over-treatment, not everybody needs to be, treatment, to, to, be, to be treated. And I'll go into a little more details. So let's look at the historical perspective of the death rate from prostate cancer. Now, these are... 2011 data, but you can see this curve over here. What happens, the curve's going up, so you could say the trajectory would have been this way, but it goes down. What happens here in 1990? Widespread adoption of PSA screening. So there's definitely been a trend. If you look at the data, this was presented by Dr. Catalona, a world-famous 
um, prostate cancer researcher. Um, back in the uh, late 1990s, um, 1979, let me look at the dates, 87, 91, the trend was increasing in late stage advanced prostate cancer. What happens here in 1991? You can see the curve drops off, dramatic decrease in late stage prostate cancer, PSA screening, correlation. And then if you look at age-adjusted mortality rates, 17,000 fewer men died from prostate cancer in 2007 than in 1992. Look at the curve here, and I, I don't have more recent data, but I think the trend speaks. If you look at the analysis of, the, of these data, the prostate cancer death rate decreased by 40% in the PSA era. And although both surgery and radiation have improved, there have been refinements to the way we treat prostate cancer, there's no, be, there's no therapeutic breakthrough. There's nothing been dramatic that's changed. Yes, radiation, we went from 5,000 reds to 8,000. We improved our surgical technique, our outcomes improved. But from an oncologic out experience, there's not been anything really dramatic. So the conclusion here is, there's no credible alternative explanation to earlier diagnosis for the prostate cancer death rate or mortality reduction that occurred since 1992. So there's clearly, you can't say there's a cause and effect for sure, but most of us believe that earlier detection, earlier diagnosis, earlier stage, earlier treatment for those men who need treatment has made a big difference. So what's the controversy? The majority of men diagnosed with prostate cancer are older, greater than 65 years, and 20 to 20, 25 to 50 percent have low risk disease. Have you all heard the term low risk or risk stratification? Who hasn't heard the term risk of risk stratification? Very low risk, low risk, intermediate risk, high risk. Familiar term, I hope, because this is this has been the change in our biological understanding where the term heterogeneity, not all prostate cancer is the same. And low risk, just to set the stage for the rest of the discussion, is clinical stage T1C to T2A. T1C means a normal feeling prostate. What does a prostate feel like if, we, if you feel it? It's like the thinner eminence of your thumb. That's kind of softish, firmish softish tissue. When you start feeling a knuckle hardness, that's a nodule, induration, that's what a, a T2A lesion, when it's small, about that big or less. So clinical stage T1C, T2A, PSA less than 10, Gleason score 6 or less for practical purposes. We only talk about Gleason 6 today. So when we talk about low risk disease, that's the NCCN, National Cancer Compre Comprehensive Cancer Network's definition of low risk disease. And traditionally, we thought that the majority of men, or 50% of all men, had low-risk disease. Well, that's changed, and I'll go into that in a little more detail. However, more than 90% of these patients will undergo active treatment that's unlikely to extend their lifespan, in contrast to younger patients or men who have high-risk disease or intermediate-risk disease who really need treatment. So the unnecessary treatment of non-threatening disease appears to be most common in older men who have often serious other medical issues that will impact their life, and so they don't necessarily need to undergo this um, aggressive treatment. So here we got it. 2012, May, this is the United States Preventative Services Task Force, Grade D. So this is a little bit of history. It's five years ago. And what does that mean? A Grade D recommendation. Well, let me just... Um, uh, give you a comment and aside. They are the group that recommended that women between the age of 40 and 49 do not get mammograms. However, women, I don't know if it's their louder voices, our wives and our um, significant others, but they made a lot of noise in Washington and that was reversed. We need to be more vocal and I'm proud to see all of you here. You share knowledge, you speak out, you analyze and I think it's important because I don't agree with a lot of what the task force has done. It's an independent organization that advises government on, on you know, how medicine should be practiced 
And I think they have good intention, but I don't necessarily agree with a lot of what they've uh, published. And case in point, they gave it a grade D recommendation, which means don't screen. It means no man should get screened for prostate cancer in their opinion. And I thought that was an aggressive approach five years ago. And the reason they made that um, uh, decision to go with this recommendation, PSA is unable to differentiate benign from malignant disease. We know that. It's not a perfect science. PSA is the best tumor marker in all of biology up until a few years ago. I don't know if there's anything better today, but it's been in all of cancer biology, PSA has been the most important tumor marker. It cannot differentiate indolent from aggressive disease. The term indolent means slow growing, sort of a, a, a tumor that's going to grow very slowly and not impact the life of the individual. Leads to excessive overdiagnosis. That's true. We did that. I was partly uh, um, uh, responsible as well. When I think back 25, 30 years ago, any man with prostate cancer would recommend surgery or radiation. Today, we're more knowledgeable. Science evolves, knowledge improves. Results in aggressive overtreatment, correct, but when you look at the, um, uh, some of the data, which I'll show you, we've changed our practice patterns ap appropriately. Now, this is the PIVOT study, the Prostate Intervention versus Observation Trial. It obviously was an important trial. It made it to the New England Journal of Medicine. There was some criticism. It was a VA study. These guys, I think, uh, George, you have to check me on this, but Tim Wolf, they're from, it was, uh, done at the University of Minnesota, the VA in, Min the VA in Minnesota. So um, I'm sure it was a, a multi-institutional study. They looked at several hundred men, and they compared surgery versus observation. It became sensational news when it came out, made it to the New York Times. Prostate cancer surgery shows no benefit for many men. Observation as effective a treatment as radical prostatectomy. And that's true. For, but it doesn't give you the whole story, and I'm going to try and dissect the story so it, it's more meaningful for you by the end of this presentation. So what did the actual results of the study look like? For low-risk patients, surgery did not offer a measurable benefit, and they defined low risk by PSA less than 10, which is one of the components of the NCCN um, categorization of low risk. Radical prostatectomy did not reduce all-cause mortality, which means dying from all causes. And it did not, and it was virtually identical, the, the prostate cancer-specific mortality was virtually identical between surgery and observation. But that's for low risk. What about men with high-risk disease? It does save lives. PSA defined greater than 10 aggressive. There was significant absolute reduction in all-cause mortality. But it's important here, radical prostatectomy reduced prostate cancer-specific mortality by 64% relative. So it did show in those men who had a higher risk disease, they got a benefit. So useful information. This was, I think, the beginning of us becoming more sensitized to the importance of risk stratification and, and differentiating disease. Unfortunately, the impact of the U.S. task force, primary care organizations adopted the recommendation and stopped doing PSA screening. In one institution, I think this was from the Oregon Health Sciences, they looked at a study, there was a 50% decline in PSA-based prostate screening after the task force gave the grade D recommendation in 2012. The recent data suggests that we've seen a decrease in low risk, which you could argue is desirable. Why find disease that's not going to bother a person? Leave them alone. They don't have biopsies. They don't go through treatment that's unnecessary. But we're seeing an increase in high-risk disease. And as George mentioned, I have an interest in research. And I'll share with you um, some of our research because this started prompting me and our group to look at our collective data. And it's a busy slide. Talk about data. He said, I'm a researcher. Here's the research. I'm not going to get into the specifics, but when I started looking at the data, and the beauty of data is sometimes it tells a story. And I got this um, data set because I'd asked our group, I was the medical director in 2011, 
And I said, we need to track our biopsy volume. I want to make sure that we're not over biopsying. We're not just uh, overdoing it. And I had a young kid from San Diego State University who helped me track our data. And I said, show me the Gleason scores. I want to look at the Gleason scores. I want to look at PSAs while you're pulling all the data. And so we got a lot of data. I'm just going to walk you through some important. In about 2014, I started looking at the data and I said, wait a minute. 48, 49% were Gleason 6 in 2011 to 12. Then it goes down to 40%, then down to 30% in 2014. Are we seeing a trend? Is this something new? And people were just starting to think about it, talk about it. Um, I'm not going to break go into all the breakdowns of 3 plus 4 is 4 plus 3, but it's important. Uh, George talked about know your Gleason score. It's not just knowing the Gleason score, a 3 plus 4 or a Gleason 7. There's a difference, I'm just going to a side comment here, 3 plus 4 and a 4 plus 3 are not the same today. And we're looking at the 4, the pattern 4, pattern 5 are the more dangerous types of prostate cancer. So if you look at all men with 7, you can have a 3 plus 4 or a 4 plus 3, but really the 4 plus 3s are the more dangerous, potentially lethal disease. So we break it down, 4 plus 3 versus 3 plus 4, when you start getting into the 8s to 10s combined score, they're all more serious and require more aggressive treatment. But the important point that came out of this was, what are we seeing here? Is there a bit of a story here, a narrative that we're seeing an impact on Gleason scores? I'm going to summarize some other aspects of the data that I just shared with you. The median PSA in year 1, 11 to 12, 12 to 13, 13 to 14, was trending higher. And remember, in pivot, they, they selected out 10 as the pivot between low risk and high risk. And what you're seeing here in our group is that we're getting a, a tendency towards higher, gray, higher PSA volume at the time of diagnosis. And this is statistically significant. So that was important. And then if you look at PSA, remember the cutoff that they used in Pivot was 10. In year one, it was 28% of men presented with a PSA greater than 10. Year two, 30%. Then the third year, 38%. And that trend continued. So the question is, are we seeing higher risk progression or tendency towards high risk disease? Our low risk has gone down from 48, which is... That's where the ballpark 50% of men have low-risk prostate cancer. Our data are exactly what we've seen in the past. 50% of men have low risk. They don't need to be treated. That's where all that statement comes from. But it's corroborated just in our group genesis with this statistic. But that's changed over three years, and it's now being consistent that our low-risk numbers have gone down and our high-risk numbers are going up. Look at the 8 to 10s. It was a 50% increase. 21% in year one, 30%. So this is a 50% increase from year one. And that got us concerned. And I'm proud. Um, this is not a long article. It's a letter. But this is from Genesis in, in collaboration with UCSD. We published this. I was the uh, first author. And th we pr 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 published this. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine last year. And we commented on the U.S. task force. I can get you a copy. You can Google this. But it's basically, should this trend continue, we may return to the pre-PSA era and the window of curability for many men, which supports what you've been saying, George, get your PSA test, uh, but appropriately. An 85 or 90-year-old man who's got significant disease, comorbidities, maybe shouldn't be screened. But I'll go into that in a little more detail. So you heard what George said earlier. The task force this week came out with a change in its recommendation. The decision of whether or not to be tested must be individualized for each man, and they've restricted it to 55 to 69 years because that's where the studies have shown benefit. But just because the studies haven't shown benefit elsewhere, it doesn't mean that a man will not benefit. And when I went into medical school you know, in the 70s, we were taught take a history, examine a patient, make an assessment, and then have a, a plan. And that plan, we call it the SOAP note. It's a 
it's a combined discussion with a patient. This is nothing new, individualizing patient care. Every patient I ever saw was given individual treatment. I just didn't pull out a book and say, well, you're, you're 60 years old, this is how you've got to be treated. We, individual, we should individualize care. Previously recommended against routine screening uses PSA, saying this was the task force, saying that the potential harms outweigh the benefits. George outlined that earlier. And so they've reduced the, the grading from a grade D to a grade C now this week. And the recommendation according to the task force definition says there's been at least a moderate certainty that the net benefit is small, um, that there's a benefit to screening, but it's small. And as I said, they restricted it to the 55 to 69 years old gentleman. It applies to the average risk and to those who are at increased risk such as African-American men and those with a family history. And these folks are men that really, I believe, don't wait till 55. You heard George, I think you said, get it at 40. And, you know, we're going to talk about genomics, but just taking a family history, asking questions. What did my grandfather die from? What did my dad die? What did my dad have? The, the, you don't need sometimes sophisticated genetic tests. You just need to know what's happened in the family history, which can alert you to how you may want to conduct your life and whether to be screened. And George mentioned again, 70 years and older, the potential benefits of PSA screening do not outweigh the harms, and these men should not be screened. I take exception with that. So you've got a 69-year-old guy who's unfortunately conducted his life in not the ideal way. He's smoked his entire life, two packs a day. He's drank six pack, pack beer a day. He's never exercised, he's obese, he's got hypertension, diabetes. And then you've got a 70-year-old man who runs marathons. I mean, I've got patients. I go to the gym and I see a, a, a friend of mine now, but he's, I took his prostate out 16 years ago when he was in his mid to late 60s. He's 83 years old and he's running marathons, one or two marathons a year. So every patient has to be individualized, and I don't think you can have a simple cut off and say, 69, that's it, sorry sir, 70 years old, next. No, we don't practice medicine. We treat individuals as individuals, personalized medicine. The AUA commented, the draft rec recommendations from the task force are thoughtful and reasonable. They're aligned with the AUA's clinical guideline, which also says 55 to 69 should be screened. American Cancer Society, College of Physicians, the ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, and the NCCN, which I mentioned earlier, all of which advocate for shared decision making. You'll see this term now, shared decision making. All of a sudden, we need to talk to our patients. What have we been doing for the last 50 years? I've always been talking to my patients, but now it's this hot topic, shared decision. This is, you, we, you guys have been sharing in the decision. You share with each other at your meetings, you get information, you talk to each other about it. We've been sharing ideas because we don't always know exactly the right thing to do and we want to have more information. The evidence for the task force change is from the European randomized study of screening for prostate cancer where they can see now slightly more men who are screened will not die from prostate cancer. That was in the case when they gave a grade D recommendation in 2012. It's been a slight increase, 0.8 to 1.3 out of 1,000. And the incidence of metastatic disease, three men out of 1,000 will avoid advanced prostate cancer through screening. So again, it's an individual choice, but it's a choice that should be made by the individual and I don't think should be restricted by this 55 to 69 years. One of the big reasons changing from grade D to grade C was this concept of active surveillance. The task force liked it, and, and I agree with them. We have changed our behavior. There's been an increase in active surveillance as first-line treatment, and this can have benefits similar to those as radiation and surgery, and I showed you the PIVOT trial where observation and uh, observation and surgery were equivalent for low-risk disease. In 2012, the task force says very few men in the United States with, were diagnosed with prostate cancer who underwent active surveillance, whereas today about 40%, and I think this refers to all men, are on active surveillance after the first diagnosis. And Dr. Christ from the task force said this was the major factor for the move from grade D to current grade C. 
that we're doing more active surveillance. So active surveillance helps address the issue of overdiagnosis and the harms of overtreatment, and I think that's an appropriate comment. So should you have your PSA done? The AUA recommendation we discussed 55 to 69, that there should be this informed or shared decision of the risks, the benefits of PSA screening, and the option of active surveillance in lieu of immediate treatment. And it's a personal decision based on many things, family history, age, whether you're symptomatic. And as this is a slide from Genomic Health, um, but it didn't di discuss and directly address the issue of high risk. And again, I just re um, repeat what George said. For most of you here, and you have sons, tell your sons to get screened at, at 40. That's my recommendation. So the dilemma for a man diagnosed with low risk disease, he's got this dilemma. What do I do? Do I choose surgery? Which type, robotic or open radical prostatectomy? I can tell you having been an open radical prostatectomy surgeon, done many of them, great operation, but there certainly are benefits to robotics. And what we're seeing now, robotics should be done by people with tremendous experience, <coughs> high volume, and good outcomes. Just because you do lots doesn't mean you get good outcomes. I would ask, what are your outcomes like? So there's been a big move from open to ro robotic prostatectomy. There are other treatments available, um, external beam, radiation, brachytherapy, cyber knife. There's all this new technology. It's getting more precise. The outcomes are getting better. So there's been significant improvements as a, across the whole spectrum of medicine. With time, fortunately, we've had in this, in this country, uh, we've had a lot of dramatic improvement. And then active surveillance. And let me define for you what I think is active surveillance. It's an alternative to immediate treatment. And some people are now saying it's timing of treatment because a lot of men who are on active surveillance will subsequently one day need to undergo treatment. It involves careful follow-up, and I'm going to really hammer home at this point of careful follow-up, because I want to address that for those of you on active surveillance. What does careful follow-up mean? With the option of delayed treatment at a time when intervention will prevent harmful disease from the disease. So it's, it's delayed potential treatment that requires careful follow-up, and as we learned today, the gentleman who's been on it for almost three decades requires careful follow-up with clinical DRE, biochemical PSA, imaging we talked about, and I'll go into it, genomics, I'm going to talk about these tests. Just want to emphasize, don't forget the finger exam. This little finger has honestly picked up many, many men with prostate cancer where the PSA didn't tell the story. Sometimes aggressive PSAs do not make, aggressive cancers do not make PSA. We call this undifferentiated or dedifferentiated cancers where the cancers are so aggressive, um, you know, to understand malignancy, it's, it's a progression, a change of the biology from normal tissue. So you start off with benign, normal tissue, pre-malignant, and then cancer. And sometimes cancers are heterogeneous. You get more indolent, like Gleason 6s, then the Gleason 7s, and the Gleason 10s. Some of those Gleason 10s, and for men who have got the BRCA gene, carry the BRCA gene, they sometimes, I've seen men with PSAs of one, the lowest PSA I've seen was 0 0.7 in a man who had a nodule in his prostate this size, about, about a centimeter. I put my finger in, Big hard lump, fortunately it was detected by the primary care doctor. But a lot, of me, a lot of doctors and even urologists don't believe much in the DRE. The DRE is important. It really adds to the clinical diagnosis. To touch on genomic testing, Oncotype DX is a multi-genomic study. Um, I'll, I'll go into it a little more detail and uh, Jeremiah can answer questions afterwards. It's made by Genomic Health, the test. It's uh, supported by Genomic Health. Polaris is another genomic assay, which is um, supported by Myriad. And Decipher is a, a test supported by Genome DX, which is a local San Diego company. So these are the three prominent genomic tests. 
We'll talk a little bit about MRI. And it's important to remember that it may, active surveillance may require delayed treatment in about 33% of men to prevent harm from disease. So if you look at the study from Johns Hopkins, which was published several years ago, they had a really aggressive approach to active surveillance. Number one, they only looked at very low risk men. And what that means, I shared with you what low risk is, very low risk is only T1C, only a normal prostate, no T2A. Gleason 6, same as low risk, PSA under 10, only two positive cores, can't have three or more positive cores, it's a very strict criteria, and no, more, no core can have more than 50% of the actual core, and a core is about that long, it's about two centimeters. So you can't have more than 50% of the core being positive for cancer. And then the final, the fifth criteria is a PSA density. PSA density is the PSA divided by the weight of the prostate. And 0.15 seems to be the magic number, 0.15. If it's less, it's desirable. If it's higher, it's not such a good sign. So those are the strict criteria. And with Hop in Johns Hopkins, they only looked at men with the, the, the very low risk or the strict criteria. They biopsied most men on an annual basis. Can you imagine having, and these guys, some of them went out for 15 years. And within that very strict cohort, that group, still 30 to 40% of men progressed. So I think that's where the careful follow-up is so important. However, the results in prostate cancer specific mortality have been less than 3% at 10 years in men who have favorable risk disease. So that's low risk and very low risk cohort. So the outcomes, what we found and what we know is that most men who die during active surveillance die from other causes, what we call competing diseases. And whether it's heart disease, strokes, other things like that. The relative risk of non-prostate cancer death was 19 times higher than the risk of prostate cancer death in most active surveillance um, um, studies. In the actuarial tenure data I just shared with you, 97% of men are alive and not dying from prostate cancer at 10 years who are on active surveillance for favorable disease. So we developed our active surveillance best practice at Genesis in collaboration with Dr. Kane at UCSD. And I'm pleased to let you know that this is going to be a collaborative between Genesis, UCSD, and another large urology group in San Diego. We developed this protocol about um, five years ago. Here are our strict criteria, which are very much like the, 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 the very low risk versus the low risk. The only difference, we allowed three positive cores. Otherwise, these are a strict set of guidelines to men who should go on active surveillance. And then Dr. Kane and I said, well, maybe we should have a liberal bucket of patients, men who may be in their 70s, who, who don't quite fit this strict, these strict criteria, but they also, if there's progression, would want to undergo treatment to prevent um, the disease harms should disease progress. And we set uh, standards, PSA as often as three months, every three to six months, the DRE every six to 12 months, prostate MRI up to the decision of the urologist, a confirmatory biopsy, and I'll talk about a confirmatory biopsy, why I think it's so important. And then genomic signatures, urinary markers, I don't have time to go into the biomarkers, but there's lots of new scientific development there, a lot of new information. But what we try to do four to five years ago is create standards for all urologists so that not everybody that, you know, you go and get 10 opinions and you get 10 different opinions, that there was standardization of care based on the best evidence out there. And as George alluded to earlier, um, the, I take great pride that we were one of the first community practices to actually publish our data. Um, and what we did in the Gold Journal, it was a lead article last year, active surveillance in a community practice. And I asked the question, how do we measure it, how do we manage it, and how do we improve it? And um, it, it was on the front cover of the Gold Journal. This is the Genesis uh, Active Surveillance Report Card. And this is the bottom line 
from the article. If you look at our data in 2006 years ago, these were all the doctors in our group. What we did, we created a benchmark. We said if you have got less than 33% of your men with low risk disease on active surveillance, that's not so good. We gave them a poor grade, gave them a red color. 34 to 66%, we said that is suboptimal. Not bad, but room for improvement. And we set the benchmark or threshold at greater than 66% optimal for each doctor, for all his patients who have low risk disease. And look at the red in the first year, a little less red in the second year. Between year two and three here, up to 2013-14, this is where we introduced solid education, best practice, comparative reporting. And now we don't, sorry, now we don't anonymously report their names. We put their names there. We say, Galus, you did this, and Smith, you did this. So we can see how we compare to each other. And doctors are pretty type A personalities. They don't, to be, they don't like to be laggards. They like to be at the top of their class. And they don't want red, red uh, marks over there. They'd rather be gold stars or green. Um, we're a pretty competitive group. That's why we got into medical school and got through, survived through residency by working hard. And we, we don't want to be outliers. And I think that speaks for most people. So. Uh, this effort to try and improve physician practice. So what is the bottom line? The first year we were at 32%, the next year 39%. We put this, this intervention, education, and comparative reporting, showing the guys' names, um, and we're up to 58% in 2014. And if you look at the data just a little differently presented, look at where we are at. For low-risk patients, Almost 70% of our men now, and I'm proud to say it's because this is why the task force changed, not because of Genesis, but they're seeing this trend across the country. But I think we've been consistent that we have really made an effort to do, to practice respon responsibly and appropriately. And if you look at our very, the strict criteria, those very low risk, almost 90%. And I've talked to some of the academic urologists at UCSF they're at 90% of their low risk of being put on active surveillance. I mean, that's a high number because we know that a, a bunch of them are not going to really be low risk. And I'll go into that why. So um, I think I'm proud of the data that I'm showing you here that we have been responsible. And when people say the doctors overtreat, it's not intentionally. The majority of us really want to do the right thing for our patients but it's new knowledge that changes practice patterns. And I think here is a case in point with new knowledge, we are now have improved our active surveillance. And if you look at this um, combined study, looking at a whole bunch of research studies from prominent Marsden, Miami, Hopkins, UCSF, Toronto, the Toronto guys, Dr. Larry Klotz from Toronto, uh, University of Toronto is one of the foremost uh, publishers and researchers in um, active surveillance. And their median follow-up was 82 months for the, this combined study. The average of the study, I believe, was about 40 months. Not a long time for prostate cancer. But if you look at the data, overall survival for men with uh, low-risk disease, 91 or 92% were um, alive, 99% uh, without any uh, prostate cancer specific mortality. But progression free survival, out at 40 months, a third of men had progressed. And that's why I speak to the importance. Don't just say, okay, I've got low risk disease, I can forget about it. No, you've got to be checked and you've got to uh, watch it. So, again, graphically depicted cancer specific survival out at 14 years, um, long term outcomes with surveillance. The majority of men do just fine for a long time, and we heard this here, case in point, uh, up to 27 years, uh, the one gentleman who mentioned earlier. So how have things changed? These are data from about five years ago, looking at newly diagnosed patients, the lifetime risk of progression and death, when I was about 3% overall for low risk. Um, 
but 90% of men were treated and only 10% were act on active surveillance. So if I, ch if I had to redo this graph today based on our statistics, the gray bar would be down to 30% um, treated and 70% were on active, active surveillance. And this is just in the space of a very short period of time, three to four to five years, that there's been this whole trend in the adoption of active surveillance for prostate cancer. So let me get into some specifics. You've seen a picture of the prostate. Just to orient you, this is a cross-section of the body. This is the front of the prostate, the back. Now the rectum would be over here. Let me give you a little bit of some background information. This zone that I'm outlining with my laser pointer is called the peripheral zone. It's the periphery of the prostate. And 70% of prostate cancer develops in this peripheral zone. That's why the finger exam is important. Because if the majority of prostate um, cancers were here in front, this is the urethra, we wouldn't be able to feel it. We can only feel this area over here. But the point made here is the, hetero, the multifocality of the disease. So let's look here. This is Gleason 6, an island, a little island. This could be one or two millimeters. Here's another island, and this is a Gleason 4. So here's the one biopsy, goes through the rectum, misses cancer, it's negative. There's two biopsies that have gone through the Gleason 6s, 3 plus 3, and then there's a biopsy that goes through an island of 3 and an island of 4, 3 plus 4. This, is, this whole island is 4 plus 4. That's called a heterogeneity of the disease, that there are pattern 4, pattern 3, that's why Gleason, the famous Don Gleason, who really did us such an incredible service, a pathologist, you know, he was from Minnesota, I think. There must be something about Minnesota. <laughs> they have nothing else to do. <laughs> okay, true. That, that, that's why, Gene, I'm here. I gave, I gave my wife three choices after the Midwest. I said, You're going, we're going south. You can go to South Africa, Boca Raton, or San Diego, but I can't live in the cold any longer. So uh, I, I think you, you're right. There's, a, there's not much else to do but do scientific research, but some great, great knowledge has come out of Minnesota. So, Ice fishing. A bigger pardon? Ice fishing. Ice fishing. Ice. The first time I, I arrived in Minneapolis, I think it was in the summer, and about five months later, I'm driving past one of the lakes, and I see these guys driving these big trucks and these little huts on the ice, and I said, what goes on? I mean... I'd never seen snow before in South Africa, literally, once, maybe once in my life. And I did see ice fishing. I couldn't believe it. So getting back to the medical side of uh, things. Um, so the final pathology in this case, if you took out this prostate, the final Gleason score would be a 7. And what the pattern is telling you, 3 plus 4. Now, remember I said 3 plus 4 versus 4 plus 3 it means that the dominant pattern is 3, which is good. If it was a 4 plus 3, there would be a lot more of this than of this, and that's not equivalent to a 3 plus 4. Because for active surveillance, some people will allow 3 plus 4, the intermediate grade, to be actively surveyed. Most of us feel it should be more confined to pattern 3 plus 3. So the heterogeneity, the different types of grades, and the multifocality, the different islands of tumor, leads to staging error of about 33%. Case in point, one of my patients, December 2011. So here's the actual pathology report in this gentleman. He had left lateral apex, left side apex over here. Here's the base, here's the triangle left lateral apex to the side, minimal disease, Gleason 3 plus 3, 2% of the core. That's minuscule. Now, most guys would say, fine, forget about it. I'm done. I don't have to worry about it. You've done, Dr. Gellis, you've done 12 cores. A little bit of confusion, a little bit of high-grade pin, prostatic intraepithelial neoplasia, and ASAP. This is a little controversial how significant high-grade pin is. But these are considered more pre-malignant. If you've got ASAP, atypical small asinoproliferation. It's a technical word. It's a pathological term 
which is considered precancer. It's interesting that it was not right next to an area of cancer in this particular gentleman. But I said, you know what? I want to confirm that I didn't get it wrong because I'm not perfect and neither is my ultrasound guided biopsy. 2012 March, that's three to four months after the first biopsy, look at the disease. Still over here, and I took 12 cores plus another four, 16 cores, and I did, uh, I, I, there was prostate cancer, left apex, I call this one and two, it's just my notation. So there was an area here, there was an area here, but look at all of this. This wasn't there. This is how it looked three months ago. It didn't change. The biopsy changed. I just happened to put the, maybe the needle over here and not over here, and the needle over here and not over here, and that was just the location of the needle. And it speaks to the multifocality. So this is called a confirmatory biopsy to confirm that we've made the right diagnosis pathologically. But moving on to the age of personalized medicine, every one of us is unique, unless we're a twin. Genetics versus genomics. Genetics examines the function of a single gene, like the BRCA gene. We're looking at one gene. Genomics looks at a complement of genes, groups of genes, and their relationships into identify, is there a combined influence? Is there a message by these different genes being analyzed together? And the Oncotype DX, I'm going to use it as an example. It's an assay. It's a multi-gene assay based on, uh, which helps physicians and patients confidently choose appropriate treatment. It's another dimension of knowledge of information. It all has to be looked at together and that's where the individualization of practice of medicine comes in. You look at the patient's clinical history, their general health, their Gleason score, the feel of the prostate, the PSA, the PSA density. But now we can add genomics. It's indicated for men with very low, low to intermediate risk prostate cancer. What does it do? It helps stratify incorporating different information at the genetic level of what's going on in the prostate tumor and it helps appropriately identify patients for active surveillance. And remember I said about 50% of men have low risk disease that don't require treatment. Today, is, as our data shows, it's about 30%. So what the genes do in the case of um, Oncotype DX, the genomic health um, uh, test, they look at four categories, stromal response, proliferation, androgen signaling, and cellular organization. So let me try and simplify it. If you think of a prostate cell, it's like a brick in a basket of cement. And the cement is the scaffold. The cell has stroma around it, which is a supporting structure. Our body is full of stroma, which supports all our organ cells. And so there's interaction between the cell and the surrounding stroma. There's interaction. And these are stromal signals. Proliferation means the turnover of cells how quickly they're dividing. And if you look at you know, bad cancers like, say, brain cancer, um, leukemia, you'll see the cell turnover. These are rapidly dividing cells. These, these tumors grow really quickly. And that's the difference between indolent and aggressive. When we talk about indolent prostate cancer, small volume, Gleason 6, doesn't change 20, 30 years. We've heard the story. But then we have some men who get very aggressive, Gleason 10, or neuroendocrine kinds of prostate cancers, these are far more aggressive, more rapid, of rapid proliferation, turnover of cells. So in the case of genomic health oncotype, they look at a gene. In the case of Prolaris, the other genetic assay, they look at exclusively proliferation. Is that correct, Jeremiah? They, they're only looking at a signal pathways of proliferation. Here we're looking at androgen signaling. We know that you've heard about androgens. There are men on, who are on androgen therapy in, in the room here. Prostate cancer is an androgen sensitive. It's se sensitive to testosterone. So they look at androgen signaling and the organization of cells. And then they compare it to re a reference gene set. 
And the combination of multiple pathways is more predictive than any single pathway. And this is the opinion of genomic health. So I love this slide because it really, I think, speaks to the value of what the, the potential of a genomic assessment is. So here you have a group of men who have very low risk disease and there are um, th is there 37 there and then 191 who have low risk and 160 men have intermediate risk. So this is based on the risk stratification that I explained earlier. We could make decisions based on this, which we have been doing, but now we have added information which helps us. And we call that the genomic score, the GPS, genomic prostate score, which provides additional biological information. And this is where I think it gets really interesting. So 35% of these men who are low risk, when we look at their genomic score, which has been tested against pathology to say what is this, what does the GPS predict in terms of the radical prostatectomy, the pathology coming out, it is very predictive of what's going to happen if you had your prostate removed. And you can see 35% uh, in the low risk had more indolent, more slow growing, favorable disease. Um, and then you can see some low risk men who thought they were fine actually move into the intermediate risk, 10% had more aggressive biology, likelihood of favorable pathology consistent, uh, and, uh, were consistent with intermediate risk. So these folks were actually more aggressive than we might have believed based on their um, initial approach, just using the clinical information. These three fellows who were thought were just fine, I don't have to come back again, I've got such uh, indolent disease, so favor very low risk, very favorable. Actually, one has low risk and two have intermediate risk. And there are some men with intermediate risk, and I would suggest that only intermediate risk patients are going to be considered for active surveillance should have three plus four, not four plus three. They're different biology. And you can see these folks who were initially a little more worried or given some reassurance that the disease may not be as bad as the clinical assessment would suggest. So what the GPS does, it enables more accurate identification of larger populations who can more confidently choose active surveillance. It's additional information. So let's just take a look at a few guys. This guy um, has a GPS score of, is that eight over here? So he's got an 84% chance, if you look at the number going down here, the, lower the, the higher the score means the more unfavorable likelihood of pathology. The lower the score, the, the better chance that you've got that if you had your prostate removed, it's going to be very favorable pathological outcome, which is the ultimate um, test of, of what's going on in the prostate. So, of these three guys, the one guy will stay here with a GPS of 25, and this, this fellow here has a, a higher GPS score that is only 57% likelihood to have favorable pathology, and um, he's probably going to, because he's moved from here to the intermediate risk, instead of saying, I'm going to go on active surveillance, maybe he will choose to go for surgery or radiation. And I hope this is clear. Uh, uh, any questions? Does, do, is this clear to you that what the genomic analysis adds is more refined knowledge of what is the real risk of the disease of having unfavorable pathology at radical prostatectomy? So case in point, 59-year-old man with a PSA 5.8. He's got a Gleason 6. He had 3 out of 12 cores. So he, by definition, is low risk, not very low risk, because he's got three positive cores, not two or less. His clinical stage T1C, which is good. His PSA density, which I mentioned, is less than 0.15 good. He's a young, healthy guy, 25 life expectancy, 25 year life expectancy. As I mentioned, he's a low risk score, and his pre-GPS 
He hasn't had his genomic test done. He's undecided. He's not sure what to do. He has a, a GPS score done, which is done on, on the biopsy, the pathology that uh, is a paraffin embedded and stored. The, um, genomic Health will analyze it, and his score is 10 low. It's a low score, and he's categorized now in sort of the very low risk. Uh, he's 83% chance of having favorable pathology. So his GPS recommendation, post-GPS, he agreed to undergo with his doctor active surveillance. His physician said, you know, you're a good candidate for active surveillance. You're clinically low risk. Your GPS score is low. You've got a high chance of having very favorable pathology in your prostate. And he um, accepted active surveillance. I'm going to finish up with just, um, I'm not going to get into details on dynamic contrast enhanced MRI. You've heard about this recently, but um, it uses gadolinium. The contrast is passed through the prostate. The, the pharmacokinetics, it's diffusion of the contrast within the gland can differ between benign and cancerous tissue. So the tissues take up these contrast agents differently. Um, this is based on angiogenesis. Angiogenesis means the vascularity. So the more blood flow, tumors tend to have more blood flow. And, and um, I think it's important. I just want to highlight some points which I'm sure were made by the previous speaker. But you really need to know your PIRAD score. It's like the Gleason score. The PIRAD score, I think it came out of Australia. But there's PIRAD 1 through 5. If you've got a low PIRAD, most probably benign 1 probably benign, intermediate, as you get up a higher PIRAD score. And this um, is based on a combination of the T2-weighted image, the diffusion-weighted image, and the dynamic contrast enhancement. So it's, the, it's a sophisticated analysis of uh, technology using um, MRI, uh, usually a three-Tesla MRI, and it really takes a good radiologist to read it. It's not just for anybody. So fusion biopsies uh, look at two imaging mo modalities. The MRI plus ultrasound uses key information from the MRI to target the cancer with real-time ultrasound, uh, real ultrasound with the MRI imaging. Some studies, and I'm not an expert on MRI fusion. I just try and follow the literature. But there is getting greater acceptance, just like with genomics. MRI, three times increase in the cancer detection rate using fusion guided biopsy, 11% in one study for the standard biopsy, 37% for the MRI fusion guided biopsy. So the goal of MRI is to progress from blind, which is, I showed you that patient of mine who initially I found one tiny little focus in the left lateral apex, and the second biopsy was um, picked up a lot more cancer. So from blind systematic biopsies to more pinpoint, more targeted biopsies. In that fellow's case, MRI, I'm not sure would have helped him because he had low-grade disease. And MRI sometimes misses low-grade disease. So that's why, from my understanding, doctors, radiologists, and urologists who are doing MRI-guided biopsies, they do the 12-core random biopsy then they do the MRI-fused directed biopsy. So it's a combination, and I think that's the way it should be done. So if you look at um, this study, patients in the trial underwent a 12-core standard biopsy and then fusion biopsy in the same setting. Low level of suspicion, the MRI-directed uh, biopsy is 4.8% positive for cancer versus 3.8% just the, bio the random biopsy alone. With moderate level of suspicion, um, the MRI detected 20.7% versus 12.3%. For high level of suspicion, 53.8% versus 29%. You can see this is the ultrasound alone directed in the green bar. The MRI added sensitivity to detection of prostate cancer. So it's certainly ga gaining traction. So in summary, the MRI ultrasound fusion um, for lesions targeting is likely to result in fewer and more accurate biopsies uh, than the present just systematic random biopsy using ultrasound guidance alone. Where should it be considered? Certainly in active surveillance. 
from what I'm understanding now that after your first random biopsy, if you've got low-grade cancer and you dis low risk prostate cancer, you decide to go on active surveillance, the next test should be an MRI-guided biopsy for your second biopsy. I wouldn't go back just for a random biopsy. It confirms low volume, low grade disease. You can follow lesions over time. It's not perfect. It improves stratification. Um, three Tesla. Three Tesla is the current gold standard in terms of the quality of the MRI you should ask for and the radio radiologist experience. And there are a few people in San Diego, I think Imaging Healthcare, um, I, I'm blanking on the fellow's name, uh, Schwartzberg, Russ. Russ. Yeah, Russ, Russ is good. He's really made an effort to study it. And then there's a, a good guy, really terrific guy who, from UCLA who's now on faculty at UCSD, who's also, and I think those two um, are two people that I know. I'm sure there are other good people. Margolis, okay. So, um, thanks, George. You're the expert. Well, the guy from UCLA that's now at UCSD. Carol. Is, is it David Carroll? Yeah, David, David, David Carroll, yeah. He's terrific. So, comes with a wealth of experience from UCLA. So, I'm just going to close with one last comment. This was a study by Stacy Loeb. She's really a terrific researcher nationally. And this was published in the Journal of Urology, I think, last year. How active is active surveillance? What is the intensity of follow-up of active surveillance for prostate cancer in the United States? Really good question. And I just highlighted during five years of active surveillance, only 11.5% and 5% of patients respectively met the testing standards of Sunnybrook, which is University of Toronto, Larry Klotz's group, and Hopkins programs. So those were the two um, really uh, leading groups in the, in, in the North American continent in terms of active surveillance. So they've got very rigid standards. But if you look at this Medicare study, it was a SEER database study, men over the age of 66, where they looked at how many patients got their PSAs done frequently, DREs, got their biopsies done, their adherence is not great. And I'm proud we have a um, relationship with UCSD uh, between Genesis and UCSD. And active surveillance is one of our primary quality measures for both groups. And we're just about to roll this out. The first measure is adoption. And as I told you, we're at about 70% of low risk. I'm, I've recommended we now look at adherence. And when we um, benchmarked and, and checked out what physicians were doing, we're going to be looking at how our doctors are performing. Because in our study, one of the criticisms of the Gold Journal study was 20% of men were lost to follow up. And that doesn't mean they just disappeared and never got managed. That means many of them went to other institutions. But th this is a concerning number of men that, that um, we're not being followed. So we want to adhere to the protocol. And then we're going to ask you folks, how satisfied were you with the care you got? Did you feel you got adequately informed? Were you able to make shared decisions? And was this a good way of, um, a good approach to helping you make decisions for prostate cancer? So I'm going to stop there. Thank you for staying awake and for uh, your attention on a Saturday morning. And I appreciate, again, the opportunity. So I'll take any questions that you have and try and answer them. OK, well, thank you very much. <laughs> we have been informed about active surveillance, haven't we? Uh, you used a word that I heard here for the first time, undifferentiated cell. I have undifferentiated cell. Anybody else have it, undifferentiated? You familiar with what that is? I learned about it uh, from your associate, Dr. Dato. I have undifferentiated, which uh, to me means uh, my PSA is not an accurate indicator of my uh, progression of, uh, of uh, prostate cancer. I have a very low PSA. But I had a biopsy, and oh my goodness, I have undifferentiated cells. And suddenly seeing these cells, it just looks like a gravel pit. And it doesn't generate much uh, of the antigen. 
so it's not a good indicator. I'm a, uh, as a result of that, I have a, a, a Gleason of nine. Otherwise, I thought I had a, a seven. I'm having nine, so it's undifferentiated. That's a key word that I learned. First time here said so. Thank you. Uh, let's let's start with questions over here, and then we'll scan over there. Any questions here? All right, let's go over here. Bang the back, way in the back there, and then you're next. Hi, uh, you talk, thanks a lot for your talk. Um, you talk a lot about people being on active surveillance, but I have a question for you on the treatment of active surveillance. Um, many of us have gone to PCRI and other conferences, uh, and they often talk about a trio of drugs that are sort of mild in treatment. And I wonder if you guys at Genesis Health here subscribe to them. Particularly, they talk about taking metformin, a statin, and perhaps something like ProScar, this kind of trio that they put active surveillance patients on, and they see some level of success. I was wondering what your opinion is on that three drugs, and do you guys subscribe to it? So, um, great question. You know, th this is a provocative science, provocative thinking, and, uh, okay, sorry. Um, so, the gentleman asked about the sort of a novel approach to adding less, some treatment, but less in surgery and radiation to active surveillance using drugs like a statin, which is, everybody know what a statin is to lower cholesterol? Well, there's, there's some provocative data in the literature that statins decrease PSA, reduce the incidence of prostate cancer, and also reduce aggressive prostate cancer. The last time, don't quote me on this, but that's kind of what I'm familiar with. So there's, there's some uh, belief that statins benefit prostate cancer in preventing it and maybe ameliorating it or lessening it. And then um, the, the other agent you talked about was Proscar, uh, which is, um, which Proscar, like Avidot and Proscar, they prevent uh, testosterone being converted to dihydrotestosterone, which is the more active testosterone. And so that has an effect in shrinking the prostate for BPH. So ProScar is indicated for treating BPH, you know, reducing the size of the prostate. And, and Avidot is dutasteride. The, the two drugs are a little different. Avidot works on two receptors. ProScar works on one receptor. And then metformin is a drug that's used for diabetes, and it's got a different pathway. And I, I don't want to speak to it because I'm not that familiar with what's known about it. But let me put that aside. So those three drugs you, you, some people are suggesting for men um, who are on active surveillance who may improve the outcomes of active surveillance. Because remember, 30 to 40 percent will progress. In fact, if anybody's interested, I'm just going to put a plug in for Genesis. We're doing a study um, at Genesis, I think it's called ENACT. And I'm a little bit out of the loop, but it's looking at... Um, uh, extendi in men who are on active surveillance. And th that's another androgen receptor blocker. So there are different approaches to looking at these kinds of adjuvant, what we call them adjuvant drug treatments. I'm just going to say aside, we talk about in medicine level one, two, three, four evidence. Level A, B, C, D, whatever you want to call it. Level one is evidence that comes from randomized prospective clinical trials. You take 500 men or women, you treat them here, and then you have placebo, and you look at it prospectively, and you get an analysis of the data, and it either says there's a big difference or there's no difference. Not retrospective, prospective. And that's the best quality information. To do randomized prospective studies is very hard to do. So what we find in medicine a lot, that doctors come up with ideas and say, well, you know, these drugs seem to have an effect that maybe they will work. So what is the evidence? I don't know of any evidence that these, this triad of drugs makes a big difference. There, there are people who are using um, Casidex. There are people who are now looking at Extandi. But I don't think there's a wealth of information to really say that it makes a big difference. I think it's a, a hypothetical belief that it will help, but I don't think categorically anybody could say, unless there have been trials that I don't know about, where all three drugs have been used compared to placebo, 
and looked at 5, 10, 15, 20 years, I really doubt that that's happened. So I think you have to ask those who are recommending it, what is the evidence? Is it just your gut feeling, intuition, that you think it's going to help? Maybe it will. But whether it's been proven scientifically, I doubt that there's a, a wide body of evidence to suggest that this is um, something that people should just adopt uh, immediately. Okay, now it's your turn. I've been associated with Genesis for the last few years, and I've had multiple urologists. And um, number one, they didn't know about this group. Number two, the ones that did are really had not a favorable comment about it. And, I just, and yet here you are representing Genesis and giving us incredible information. And I just wondered if any thoughts, feelings you had about that. Um, listen, I'm here for the third time because I like this guy and I like Gene and I like you all and it's a pleasure to come back and, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's ignorance and I can't speak for all my associates, um, but it's certainly something that I need to take back to Genesis and I will bring back and, and maybe put out, um, you know, as Chief Scientific Officer, I can send out a blurb this weekend and say, it was a real privilege to meet with the Informed Prostate Cancer Support Group it's a great organization. You guys deal with credible science and information and knowledge and that uh, we should encourage our patients to attend. By the way, we're having a prostate cancer symposium in June on, um, on prostate. We usually have about 300 men. So we do this, but not at the detail level that you do it. We bring in speakers and we have a four hour. I think you've been to one of them, George, and you're welcome. But your point's well taken, and uh, I will educate uh, my colleagues as to the virtues of this organization. Okay. Lyle? It's a politically touchy issue. Uh, with Dr. Cohen? Ed? Um, well, the problem with us is we've integrated and we've got radiation oncology, and if we brought in an oncologist, it would just create barriers and relationships with other oncologists. So large, large groups across the country, some of them have medical oncologists. We would like to have dedicated medical oncologists, but we don't, want to, we don't feel it's appropriate to bring in a specific oncologist into our group. It would just be a little bit of a political issue in terms of referral patterns and associations with other medical oncologists. But, you know, just to your point about medical oncology, and this is beyond the scope of this talk, uh, chemotherapy is now, you know, when it used to be for very late stage disease, for men with metastatic disease who are just starting hormones, there's a lot of scientific information to say men should be on combined hormones and chemotherapy based on the Stampede trial and charted studies. Those are two big studies. So I think medical oncology is going to have more of a role in prostate cancer. Next question. Okay, uh, let me just uh, expand on uh, this, this wonderful group. <clears throat> when uh, my cancer recurred, I went to a urologist and I, uh, uh, Lyle uses the analogy, he asked me to bend over and gave me a Lupron shot. Uh, and then I asked him, should I go to a support group? He said, no. And I said, no, why not? Well, they're a bunch of whiners. And we have no whiners in here. Is there anybody here who's a whiner? Okay. I came here, and this is, <laughs> I came here seven years ago, seven years ago, and uh, learned more in 10 minutes than I knew in 10 years. And that's why I, I didn't follow his directions. I came here three days later, and I learned a lot, and I'm still coming back and learning. So uh, this is a wonderful group, and thanks to Lyle and Gene that uh, carry, carry the ball and uh, move this thing forward, and thank you for coming back. It That's works good. if you work it. Okay, a question here. Uh, it seems to me that the recommendation of the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force uh, is doing more disservice than helping the American public. Why does uh, <clears throat> my main question here is 
uh, how come the American uh, Neurological <coughs> Association or a group of American prospect oncologists <coughs> make their proper recommendation about PSA testing? So um, your point's well taken, and we are not um, great fans of the task force for what they did, and even what they're doing now. They're getting better, at least they've changed from a D to a C. Uh, but these are independent organizations that believe that they are doing the service to the nation by looking at population health. You know, there's another whole side to the equation. Uh, medicine, and I don't want to tangentialize too much, but I think it's important that we're going to run out of money. Healthcare inflation in the United States is about 18% today. It's about $3 trillion, 18% of GDP. So if you look at Europe, all first world countries are at about 9.5, 10, 11, 12. We're almost double most developed countries in the world in terms of what it costs us to take care of people. And it's a big problem for this country, and that's why there's all this new health care legislation, the Affordable Care Act, and there's this new, new law called MACRA, which is looking at value-based purchasing. What's the best value? And to the task force's credit, yes, we were over-diagnosing and over-treating prostate cancer. Any man 10, 15 years ago, 70s, 80s, we got PSAs on everybody. Now we're talking to men, you know, if you're 75 or 80, maybe you don't need a PSA. So there has been some virtue to what they've done. But I think, in my humble opinion, they've done a lot of harm by giving it a grade D. And where are we? The AUA came out, and we weren't even happy with the AUA's recommendation, 55 to 69. That was about four or five years ago, where their guideline for PSA screening is 55 to 69. But one has to recognize, and to the point that I spoke earlier about the triple therapies that the gentleman asked me, the AUA makes recommendations on scientific knowledge. And if we don't have the knowledge, they can't make a recommendation. So the European study on screening looked at, showed a benefit for men between 55 and 69. So as a population, they came out and said, this is a population recommendation. But on an individual basis, I mean, you know, if I had a 45-year-old man come in and he told me his grandfather and his father died of prostate cancer, would I look at the guideline? No, I'm looking at the patient's history with him and say, let's get a PSA. So your, your point's well taken. We don't think it was a great service, but there was some benefit because it, it's made us more sensitized to who should we screen and how should we screen and to be more aggressive with active surveillance. So I think if I would have given the talk here five years ago, it's very different today. Okay, so question back there. Yeah, a few years ago, I was taking a natural product called beta cytosterol for uh, BPH, and, and it's supposed to block uh, dihydro testosterone, you know, DHT. Right. right. And I started producing estradiol in my body. Is estradiol uh, a problem with FEC? Well, estradiol is an estrogen. It's, it's a, and we used to treat uh, prostate cancer metastatic. If you look at the original treatment of hormone therapy before what we call the LHRH agonists and antagonists, the Lupron, you know, all those kinds of drugs, we used to give estrogen. Um, the problem with estrogen, and I'm, don't get it wrong, I'm not saying estro, you know, the beta cytosterol gets converted to estradiol, you're going to get the fix, but we stopped using estrogen, DES, diethylstilbestrol, 20 years ago or 30 years ago from a VA study that showed more men died from strokes and heart attacks because it's like birth control. Estrogen can cause strokes and other side effects. So that's why we've stopped um, using estrogen. But estrogen does have a suppressing factor. What happens with estrogen, without getting too technical, but estrogen feeds back in the brain at the hypothalamus and the pituitary and blocks the production of LHRH, which is, causes um, testosterone production at the testicle level. So it, it, that's, how, that's how ADT works, by blocking these receptors up here. So estrogen has an effect on prostate cancer. How it's going to affect 
a prostate cancer with on beta cytosterol, I can't answer that, but I want to give you some background regarding estrogen and prostate cancer. Okay, question there. So I'm going to take a shot at it, and then I'll ask um, Jeremiah to comment because you know he, this is what he specialises in. Uh, he's not a physician, but and he, and he represents the company. Just disclosure, but I, I'm sure he'll give us an unbiased opinion. So the three tests, Oncotype DX, as I showed you, looks at four different categories. Proraris looks at proliferation primarily. Um, Oncotype DX looks at the prediction of if you had your prostate, if a man has an Oncotype score, a GPS score of such and such, what's the chance of him having favorable pathology or unfavorable pathology if his prostate's removed? Meaning, would it be more advanced that the cancer's out of the prostate, does it go into the seminal vesicles? And that's unfavorable pathology. Prolaris looks at the risk of 10-year mortality. And you know, I think it's useful, but you know, we know that so many men are alive at 10 years, you really want to know what 15, 20-year mortality is, and it only looks at proliferation. Genome DX have just come out with a paper on a small subset of patients looking at um, predicting uh, sort of a, a aggressiveness on their, using their test. But their test has been really based on whether a man needs to have radiation therapy, will he, whether he'll benefit from it if he's got adverse pathology, if the cancer's out of the prostate, or if he's got PSA rising, if he's got you know, late, what you call biochemical failure. So they, the three tests are positioned a little differently. And I really think, as a physician, you know, we don't use every drug, every test, every operation. We develop a comfort level. We choose and select what we think is most meaningful for us to help our patients. And you know, there's the individual influences of each test and the individual sort of benefits in terms of the, what the tests uh, define. So let me ask um, Jeremiah just to comment. In yeah, I think you're great job, Dr. Okay, let me give you the mic, and then you might want to refer to this. This is available outside showing the various uh, uh, genomic st uh, studies. Thanks, George. Three minutes. It's a long time. I don't need that much time, George. Thank you. Um, okay, so to answer your question, uh, Dr. Gates did a, did a great job answering that. Um, so really there's some similarities with these tests as well. They're, they're all RNA-based tests. So they're not DNA tests. They're RNA, a little bit different downstream, uh, RNA-based tests, okay? So as Dr. Gates mentioned, it all depends on what you're trying to answer. So when we're working with the physicians, we say, what is the question you're trying to answer? If you're trying to answer, um, what's the likelihood that I really don't trust that biopsy? As Dr. Gillis showed the data a little while ago, that you can see about 30% or about a third of men, the, the, the radical prostatectomy, the gospel, if you will, actually in what's in that gland does not match the biopsy. All right, so that's about a third of the time. If they're three plus three, if they're three plus four, it's as high as about 50%. About 25% of those men are actually downgraded to more favorable disease, about 25% upgraded, okay? So if you're trying to determine the likelihood that something is bad in the gland, with sampling about a half a percent of that tissue, which based on the average size gland of about 30 grams, that's what Oncotype would give you. Prolaris looks at a different set of genes. Uh, they look at more genes, but really in the cell cycle proliferation. Um, it's a test, um, and I'm, uh, I'm not drinking the Kool-Aid here, a test that was not specifically designed for prostate cancer. However, they feel that proliferation is probably pan-cancer. Um, that, that it's very relevant regardless of the cancer. Uh, Decipher itself is a different platform. It uses RNA, but able to look at thousands of genes. It's called microarray technology. The other two are both uh, what they call RT-PCR. Very good with hundreds of genes and the dynamic range, the ability to look at the expression of these genes in the laboratory is very good. Microarray looks at thousands of genes, but not as deeply, if you will, kind of like a, a dimmer on a light switch. They're kind of like it's on, half on, half off, off. 
Whereas the other two tests can look at, you know, you can dim it as much as you would like. And that becomes important when you're looking at gene expression because sometimes, um, you know, overly expressed genes or a lot of signaling can, can mean a good, a good outcome or a bad outcome. And also the, the, the same is said for very low expression. So, you know, that's just really kind of a, kind of the difference in the three tests. Um, Decipher has really good data on post-radical prostatectomy. What's the likelihood you'd have recurrence of disease? Um, Oncotype, the likelihood that you miss something in the gland. Prolaris, the likelihood that you would die from your prostate cancer within 10 years. Any more questions around that? That's a great comment, Jeremiah. Thank you. So it, it's, we're still, when we looked at our study, sir, in um, the, the Gold Journal paper, only two Two to three percent of men in that group had a genomic testing. We're seeing it become more broadly adopted. We're still learning, and I think you, you know one has to do the homework to try and understand what are the nuances, the differences between the tests, and ask you know what information do I want out of the test, and then select the test. I, I have a question uh, for those on active surveillance. <clears throat> Uh, is uh, the multiparametric uh, MRI an, an option before doing the biopsy? I, I don't think that, and again, I'm not an expert, I don't think you should rely on a multiparametric MRI. I think the first biopsy, um, a, a randomized biopsy is fine, but I think with time, as we find the accuracy of uh, multiparametric MRI gets better, and you've got good radiologists with greater accuracy, perhaps we'll stop doing randomized um, uh, biopsies, you know, what we call cognitive or ultrasound guided random. We'll be doing more um, MRI guided, but I think this, at the moment, from what I hear, we should be doing a 12 core random biopsy plus the fusion biopsy. But I, I think MRI is going to be helpful for active surveillance patients to follow lesions because if they see a lesion and it's small, they may want to just watch it. But I think there's going to be a need for um, biopsies, confirmatory biopsies, and genomics. I think this is all going to, you'll have, you know, if you have favorable Gleason score, favorable MRI, favorable genomics, I think that's worth a lot to be reassured that you know, you're doing the right thing in active surveillance, and then maybe get a confirmatory biopsy. But I've heard Eric Klein, who's the chairman of um, Cleveland Clinic, who's a brilliant, world-famous prostate cancer expert. Um, and he's done a lot of work with genomic health, and I, I'm not trying to put in a plug, I'm telling you what I heard. He says if he's got a good GPS score for a patient, he doesn't do confirmatory biopsies. So he's relying but that's one individual's approach, and he's a very bright, thoughtful, analytical guy. He's the editor of the Gold Journal. So, um, you know, he, that's been his decision. Now, whether he still does it, I don't know, but uh, he put a lot of credence in the genomic test. So I think it's, to George's point, why are you here is to learn and understand what are the different options that you have, because we don't always know exactly what's right, and, and I think it's important to be a good advocate for yourself and for your, your, your significant other. Hey, you, sir. I think just watch the PSA. I think, um, you know, the PSA is very good but it, it takes a while to nadir, and then it's, you know, you hope it's going to be a flat line after the, or once it's nadered. What about this one that you The PIRAD score. Yeah. The PIRAD is, is with the MRI, that's before radiation. That's, wow. that, that is when they look at the prostate before the radiation. biopsy, and they come up and say how suspicious is this area, and it's a pyrad one through five. Uh, all right, a question here. I have a question. Uh, what I've heard in talk to, to the doctors about at the symposiums is that the genomic testing 
at this point in time is not really applicable to someone who's had uh, a, 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 a prostatectomy or failure in radiotherapy to, to have a genetic uh, test. Is that, is that correct? And I, and I think that that's appropriate. Um, you know, there, there's no point, you know, you, you could only do the genomic testing. You can't do it on the radiated prostate. You'd have to do it on the biopsy. Oh, we so, yeah. yeah, not a yeah. It has to be I mean, from the Right, but you, you would have had any man before treatment would have had a biopsy. And, and how long can you do uh, genomics on a biopsy? How many years after the biopsy? Well, we have, we have the technical ability to go, you know, 15 years back. You start to lose. You start to lose RNA you know, 10 years or so even when it's preserved. However, we don't want to tell you where you were 10 years ago, right? Yeah. So really, we only will accept that tissue typically within three years. So the, the only thing is, um, if you had radiation and you, you're worried about it and you wanted to know, you know, is there more information? Should I be more aggressive if new treatments come out? I think that's hypothetically about the only case you'd go back and say, you know, did I do the right thing? Or if the PSA starts going up, should I be more aggressive? Just to understand the difference in the biology based on what the genetics is telling you or the genomics. Okay, let's take this group over here. Any questions? All right. No, any, all right, you, sir. Comment on the value of I wish I could, I can't. I've never done it, and I know the folks up in Los Angeles area do it. You know, again, again, it's to the gentleman's point. You, you're going to go and find doctors who have very uh, different approaches. You know, there's mainstream, and then the guys that are out there, and they may be right, um, but I, I don't think that color Doppler is mainstream today. I think MRI. You know, I, I read a lot more about MRI. I hear a lot more about MRI. I think there are a few groups who've developed uh, a, a color Doppler experience and believe in it. Has it been compared scientifically to MRI? I don't know. But, um, you know, I think the, the, the wealth of knowledge on MRI is out there. And personally, I would rely more on an MRI than a color Doppler. I'd like to comment on that. I've had I've had both, and uh, uh, there's very few that really have the expertise to do color Doppler, and it's the, and that's Duke Bond and the and the group up in uh, uh, Marina del Rey. Uh, it requires a great deal of craftsman and uh, experience in doing it, and so your I think your average urologist would not be very good at doing that as opposed to an MRI expert. Uh, so, uh, any other? Uh, okay, question. I've had both recently, and they were very close. They lined up very, very nicely. Right. There's a big difference in cost. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's that's why the other the other uh, term for PSA other than prostate specific antigen is prostate uh, specific uh, patient specific anxiety or something uh, something like that because of the variability. You know, there's no blood our sh blood sugars, our blood pressure. You know, we're not constant dynamic organisms. I mean, there's variability and the PSA goes up and down. But the trend is important. And I've always, when I look back 30 years of practice, and I, what has been one of the most meaningful values of PSA? Absolute number, sure. You get a man who comes in with a PSA of 100, we've got a real big problem. You've got a man who comes in with a PSA of 2.5, so it looks good. The next year it's 3.5. Two years later it's 5 or 6. That's a problem. So that trend, so the, the, the fluctuation, the variability, as long as it's not like this, you know, that kind of curve, if it's like this, so that the mean is pretty flat, I, I don't get too concerned. With a little, there's a lot of noise in PSA. Yeah, that you brought up a very important point about active surveillance. You don't have all those side effects of incontinence and impotence and, and things like that. The only side effect is some anxiety about what's going on and what's my nest test going to show. 
but uh, you're avoiding all kinds of other uh, quality of life issues on active surveillance. So that's a good feature. Yes, sir. Texanes, Texatur, Texanes. Uh, the the chemotherapy Texatur is one of the main the mainstay of chemotherapy. It was used when everything else failed. So we got through first line hormonal, second line hormonal therapy, Extandis, Itiga, all of those drugs. Then you know on medical oncologists would put the patient on chemotherapy, and it showed a benefit, not a huge benefit. Um, in advanced prostate cancer, but what we found now through two studies called Chartered and Stampede, that there is, I think Chartered found about a 17-month survival difference. But this is for men with metastatic prostate cancer who have not started hormones yet. So it's right in the early stage before, and I think I spoke about castrate-resistant prostate cancer here before. But uh, that's advanced prostate cancer, but that's where chemo is starting to have a much bigger role. Early metastatic prostate cancer. Okay, I have time for one more question. There you go, sir. Uh, doctor, how would a proposed TERP for BPH for someone on active surveillance uh, affect future treatment if it, if it is needed? Um, great question. Again, there's, you know, there's, how would a, I've got to repeat the question, how would a TERP impact future treatment uh, in a man on active surveillance? So if you needed radiation or radical prostatectomy. It, it depends on the, the degree of aggression of the surgeon. So the old timers, the guys who taught me how to do TERPs, I mean, they took out every little minuscule piece of BPH. They scraped that gland. They were so good at it because that's all they did. When I trained, we and now, today, I, I wouldn't have a tip by one of the younger guys because we've got all these medicines, we've got minimally invasive surgery. So the experience that urologists get doing TERP is not as much as we did 30, 40 years ago. So an aggressive TERP, you know, you, you're resecting the prostate, you may be getting a little bit of the muscle, which is the valve, the external sphincter, which you shouldn't, but you never know. So the impact there could be, for example, if you have brachytherapy and you've had a previous TERP, the incidence of incontinence is pretty bad. So um, it might impact it, but I've done radical prostatectomies uh, on men who've had TERPs who've done just fine. But it depends on how aggressive the TERP was done and also how well the radical prostatectomy is done. So uh, I think there's variation in that, but certainly it's better not to have had a TERP. Um, I've always wondered about resecting, cutting through cancer. You know, when you do a TERP, you're, you're actually just cutting through the tissue and you open up all these channels and you're pushing in water so that you can see, you're flushing it out. And can you embolize? Embolize means, you know, shoot cells into the vascular system. Can you get cells going through um, the vascular system. So the old TERP, which cuts, I wouldn't be a, and this is just hypothetical in my own personal opinion, but the new techniques of vaporizing where you don't cut, but you just burn and you vaporize the tissue. So you don't maybe have as much uh, chance of getting cancer cells going into the bloodstream. And that's just a, a hypothetical, don't quote me on this, it's my own just personal concern. So what was the original treatment? BPH. BPH, but what was the, the technology used? The green light. Green light laser. Um, so, you know, there's vapor, there, vaporization means just burning the tissue, whether it's from laser or, but there's a lot of, there's now steam, there's a new treatment called Resume, which is steam. There are a lot of new treatments. But the, the, I think ACMI have a button which I used to use because I, 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 I tried green light laser, red light laser, and I wasn't crazy about them. I f didn't feel the control. But there's this button which really just melts the tissue away but doesn't cut the tissue. And again, it's just maybe a little paranoia in, in me 
that I don't like to cut through cancer, I'd rather just burn it away to mitigate the risk of cancer cells being pushed into the bloodstream. What was the alternative? It's the, the button. I, I, it's the ACMI, uh, a big company, and they, it's, it's a, it's, I think it's called the, I don't know if it's the vapor, but it, it doesn't cut, it's this little, uh, little disc that tr drives up a tremendous heat that just coagulates the, the tissue. But again, it's, it's just a hypothetical concern on my part. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Thanks. Kalis. Thank you. We really appreciate it.